Hey guys, Aravind here and welcome back to the channel. Yesterday, I officially graduated from the London School of Economics and Political Science with a first class honours in BSc Economics. Tomorrow, I'll be starting my first day at work as an infrastructure private equity analyst. Today, I wanted to really talk about my time at LSE, give an honest perspective um, or an honest opinion on my time here and talk about um, anything that really differed between you know, my first expectations of how my three years here would be and how it actually ended up being in reality. I really want to focus a bit more on the things that they don't necessarily tell you about LSE, the things that you won't really get from just reading uh, the website or any student articles. I want to talk about the things that you really, really under only understand if you've actually spent three years here. Just a quick caveat, um, this video is entirely based on my own experiences at LSE. Um, anyone who's been to LSE, you might have vastly different experiences to my own and um, my opinions don't reflect that of the scores and anyone joining the school in the future may have vastly different experiences to my own as well. I'll be splitting the video into six sections. Uh, the timestamps will be in the description below so you can uh, navigate to the part that you find most interesting if you want to. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about location. Now, LSE is located very centrally uh, in London, and so there's loads and loads of things to do. Um, there are so many places to eat, to explore, to go shopping. Um, you name it, basically, London will have it. Um, and I think it's a really, really enjoyable experience. I I've been here three years now, and I'm only just scratching the surface of what London as a city has to offer. And besides leisure, um, there's also kind of the careers element of it as well. Most major businesses have their UK headquarters um, in London. And so going to and living, going to LSE and living in central London uh, just means that those firms are incredibly accessible to you. Uh, those firms tend to, um, you know, have networking events if they have, if they're on, if on campus, obviously it's easy for you, but you know, sometimes they're at their offices and then it's just a very, very easy commute for you. Um, so we're talking things like spring weeks, summer internships, you're already in London, you can quite easily commute and access those banks and access those networking and insight opportunities, um, which can be a bit more difficult um, when, it, when, when your university isn't based in London itself because you obviously have to spend time and money um, basically commuting uh, to London in the first place to attend any of these events. So that's a major advantage that living in London itself uh, provide you with. Another thing that is quite nuanced is the fact that a lot of startups um, are also based in London and the reason why I want to mention this is because if you were unsuccessful with your spring weeks and are still looking for work experience, again living in London has a massive advantage because you can still get relevant work experience at smaller name firms or startups um, to bolster your CV. I think that's a lot more difficult to do when you're based in other cities because you just don't have access to those same opportunities. That being said, London is or living in London is incredibly expensive. Um, your rents are probably between two to four times more expensive uh, than they would be in other cities. For example, uh, one of my best friends um, studies medicine in Birmingham and his room is much nicer than mine and he's paying less than half of what I pay per week in rent. So, you know, the, you're paying a premium for the location, I guess. A second thing I really want to talk about is LSE's brand value. LSE has a very strong name, especially within the social sciences or the finance industry. Um, I think it holds a lot of weight. Within finance, LSE is considered somewhat of a unanimous target university, meaning that large firms or firms in general tend to target or actively hire students from LSE compared to other, other universities because the academic reputation or reputation in general that LSE students have for being intelligent and smart um, is very well known. And statistics speak for themselves with LSE dominating or often dominating uh, the analyst classes in the majority of large investment banks. That being said, I think that those statistics are somewhat misleading. I remember applying to LSE and thinking about just by going to LSE, um, you know, my, you know, I'd be all but guaranteed um, a spot as you know, a summer intern or an analyst at an investment bank. And that just really is not the case. Although I can't be certain of this, I personally think that the reason why LSE ranks so highly or places so well into investment banking is simply due to the sheer number of applications made by LSE students. In previous years, 41% of LSE graduates applied to investment banking. Because LSE is so specialised, a large number of students are all aiming towards very high paying, very prestigious finance jobs. And so it's no surprise that you know, some of them do get in and make up the majority of the investment banking analyst class. The third thing I really want to talk about are the events and opportunities that LSE provides. LSE's strong brand name means that it can attract very well-renowned, well respected speakers to give talks at the institution. This holds not only for LSE's public events, which are available for both students and members of the public to attend, but what really surprised me the most was the strength of some of LSE's student societies. I was astounded to see that some of LSE's student societies were able to attract speakers um, such as CEOs um, from large companies such as Rolls-Royce and Monzo Bank, uh, Nobel laureates such as Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, and even footballing stars such as Patrice Evra gave talks um, at the institution. And so, 
yeah, it's something that I didn't really expect would be possible. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't actually attend too many of these talks, and it's something that I wish, in hindsight, that I'd done more. Similarly, major firms also come to campus and provide um, great opportunities to network, learn more about the firm uh, in a really informal environment. Um, and these are very, very big names within the finance industry that I'm talking about. Um, and so these, there are really, really great opportunities for LSE students um, to learn more and to um, you know, increase or boost their chances of um, gaining employment in the future. Right, probably most controversial topic here, which is LSE's sense of community. And I think that LSE has a bit of a reputation for having a lack of community, uh, being ultra competitive and at times really toxic. And you know, I wanna talk quite a bit about this because I think there's more to it than meets the eye. Community wise, I think it's true that LSE definitely could do more to create a sense of shared community between the different departments at the university. There's nothing that really brings the whole university together to celebrate. Um, you know, there's nothing that, there's no interdepartmental balls, no opportunities for people to really come together and celebrate anything. Um, and I think that's a real shame and it's something that, you know, the university could probably do um, or look towards improving. The closest thing that LSE really has in terms of bringing people of different departments together is something called LSE 100, which if you're an LSE student, um, you know, is a bit of a meme. Um, for those of you who don't attend LSE, um, it's basically a additional compulsory module um, that you have to do in your first and second year um, at LSE. The module really looks at trying to solve or provide some sort of solution towards a global issue, for example, food security or the potential dangers of AI. And the intention is that you use some of the skills and techniques that you've um, developed from your respective departments or studying your, your respective um, courses. It's pretty well intentioned, but the problem is it's just simply not engaging or entertaining enough for people to really take seriously and want to dedicate time towards. Another element of LSE's community, or lack thereof, is the diversity of intake. LSE has a very large international student body, and you do tend to find that people um, of the same ethnicity or from the same country do tend to stick uh, together. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing at all. I think it's, I think it's very natural for people who, have, who share the same culture, the same language, you know, to be drawn towards one another, be more comfortable around one another, and consequently form uh, friendship groups. But I think at times, if you're you know, not you know, if you're not from that country, it can sometimes be difficult to really bring or really develop or build strong relationships with those people. Uh, I'm not saying that's anyone's fault, but it's just it's just something that I've noticed. Like, I think something even more nuanced than this is within the domestic uh, student intake itself. I found that a lot of the domestic students um, came from London. And so, you know, coming in as a fresher, I found that a lot of people already knew each other from school or through family friends and things like that. And again, because of that, at times, um, I found that, you know, Certain friendship groups were already fairly well formed even prior to coming into university. That being said, given all, despite all these problems like, or issues, um, I have a, an incredible set of friends from LSE now and I'm incredibly grateful to have met every single one of them. And you can overcome these problems. I have a very diverse set of friends, um, both domestic and international. So I think it does require extra effort perhaps, but you can, really can make incredible friendships at LSE. Finally, on LSE's competitive culture. I feel like I could potentially get a lot of stick for this, but a part of me, does quite like it. Now hear me out, people here are really smart and ambitious. They want to make the most out of their degree, maximize their career opportunities. And that's something that I want really, really respect. And it keeps me motivated as well. People here tend to have lots of extracurriculars, lots of things going on, you know, outside of their degree. And you know, I find this incredibly inspiring. It motivates me to try, you know, do things outside of university myself to learn more about, um, you know, finance, to um, see what other things that I could potentially be doing. Um, and you know, it makes me, uh, it provides a sense of drive and ambition that, you know, I'm not sure would be as high if I didn't go to this university. That being said, I can understand why this pressure um, to get internship offers, to keep up with others, to be working on side projects, just basically to excel can be considered toxic. Um, you know, it can lead to a lot of insecurity and, you know, it can really, it can really cause burnout because, uh, you know, there are some people who just will not stop until you know they can they have an offer or if they don't get an offer you know that can cause a lot of anxiety based on conversations i've had with friends who attend other universities it seems that lse generally seems to be a lot more career driven or career oriented than a lot of other university students and i can personally attest to this during freshers week i was expecting people to you know be talking about you know what club they were going to go that night but you know at the dinner table i often heard you know, people talking about like what spring weeks they'd applied to and I just remember being really shocked and not was shocked but confused because I didn't even know what a spring week was at the time so you know that's the sense of the culture here like people are informed um, and you know a lot of them have a plan 
uh, in their head on where they want to be. There are pros and cons to this. On one hand, you gather a lot of information just by listening to other people talk. Uh, that's how I applied a lot of my knowledge about you know, in investment banking, private equity, the differences of different parts of the finance industry. You get a lot of it just by talking to people and, and informing yourself and doing a bit more research on the things that people are just talking at the dinner table about. But on the other hand, um, you know, it does result in that somewhat toxic or potentially toxic environment that I mentioned earlier. And it arguably could reduce people's creativity because people who initially weren't even thinking about doing investment banking or finance and wanted to be an entrepreneur, for example, they might inadvertently be, get pushed down the finance route simply because that's the LSE thing to do. Um, and I think that's a, a real shame. Um, given that we are talking about university, it only makes sense for me to also cover the actual quality of teaching at LSE. The quality of the professors in terms of uh, their academic achievements and even their recognition is second to none. We have world-renowned professors and they are writing the leading theories in their respective fields. They're coming up with new theories, they're writing the textbooks that other universities are using. In terms of the actual content being taught, you really cannot complain. It's very interesting stuff, um, very new, uh, very groundbreaking. That being said, I found that you know, being clever, being world-renowned, having incredible academic achievements yourself doesn't necessarily translate towards being a good teacher of the subject that you're an expert in. Often, I found that the problem was that the lecturers assumed that we possessed knowledge that we simply didn't. They assumed that we knew concepts that we did not and, and taught the lectures based on those. And so it was really, really hard at times to follow the content and really understand what they were getting, um, you know, they were actually trying to explain to us. And I found out that, you know, this was the case even after reviewing and watching the lecture three, four, five times, understanding the concepts was, was quite difficult. Other times I found that the issue would be as small as, as a typo in the slide. And, you know, it's important to keep in mind that as economic students, a lot of the time you're dealing with mathematical equations where one equation links to another equation. And so if the first equation is wrong due to a change in sign or one variable being wrong, it means that all the other equations are affected. And so it can often be quite, you know, when these mistakes are made, it can be quite difficult to figure out if there's a mistake in your understanding or if there's a typo in the slide. And that means that you can't really follow the, less, the, the rest of the lecture. And the thing is, is that because the, you know, when you're in the lecture hall or watching this lecture, you don't pick up on on the error immediately because you just take it as given. Um, but when you're reviewing the lecture, revising for the lecture, uh, revising for exams, you know you, you pick up on these on these potential typos, and then you know it casts doubt onto your entire understanding of the topic. These problems are further extended by the fact that the teachers, the class teachers of a lot of these modules, are PhD students, and it's a bit of a blessing and a curse at the same time. Uh, you know, you're kind of playing roulette with the with the quality of your of your class teacher. Some of them are very very good at explaining things in a way that's easy for us to understand, but at times, you know, some of the, some of the class teachers, the quality of their teaching just isn't up there. And I and, it, and at times it felt like I knew more about the content than the teacher did. Now the final thing I really want to talk about is the support from the department. This was the thing that I felt was most lacking from the university. Personally, for me, it felt that after Freshers' Week, we kind of left to our own devices to figure it out ourselves. And yes, that's a part of university, I guess, but there definitely could have been some elements um, where, you know, there was more guidance from the university on how to deal with certain things. And they'll say that, you know, there's support available. Um, you can reach out to them to, you know, help, you know, review your essays, um, the LSE careers department or other. But, you know, it's not very well advertised um, and I think there's a lot of doubt or uncertainty on like what services are available, whether they're actually useful. Uh, and so I think LSE could probably do a better job highlighting what's available. Additionally, there are definitely some administrative aspects of LSE that could be better. For example, we get lots of emails and often, you know, they're quite uncoordinated. We'll get emails from different people giving us different instructions or for example, uh, we'll get key instructions to do, uh, but they'll be buried really deep, like in the middle of the email in like small print um, and just things like that. And because of that, I found that, you know, I've missed out on opportunities that I, I really would have um, liked to take part in simply because either the email didn't you know, hit my inbox um, or it was just buried in this fine print of an email and things like of that nature. And then finally, I just find that sometimes departments have really weird policies. For example, a few weeks ago, I attended LSE's Department of Economics graduation ball. And I found it really weird to see that the department had started selling tickets for people outside of the department without first ensuring that everyone who was actually graduating that year from the Department of Economics actually had 
um, a ticket guaranteed or the option to reserve a ticket before everyone, anyone else had access to them. And so I found that people who had studied economics at the university for three years weren't able to buy a ticket for their own graduation ball, but other people, even people who went from the university were able to do so, uh, which I just thought was, was very weird. And then similarly, the, the university say they care about our mental well-being a lot. We get a lot of emails about them, but then they have some policies that really don't make sense. They could just change them. Uh, and you know, student well-being would improve so dramatically. Um, for example, a lot of modules have policies where they don't provide answers to past papers, um, or they, if they do, they provide it to a very, very limited number of past papers. And for most students, all our lives, we've practiced or prepared for exams by doing past paper questions, uh, trying to replicate exam environments and doing exam style questions. If those aren't available to us, how are we meant to revise um, adequately. And the other thing is when you're, and sometimes when you're giving us just the past paper but not the solutions to them, again, if I'm preparing, how am I meant to know if what I've written as my mock answers or my answers to a previous past paper, how am I meant to know if they're correct? And so LSE simply by changing some of these policies or the Department of Economics by changing some of these policies could significantly improve, you know, student satisfaction or mental well-being. Okay, so that wraps up today's video, guys. It's been an honest review of my time at LSE, things that people might not necessarily know about, or, um, you know, on, upon first glance, uh, and hopefully I've shed some more information uh, that's useful for you guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, please like, subscribe, share uh, the video, and let me know down below in the comment section what you'd like to see next.